Good morning. And uh, if you look at the creative age 
And you'll find this in, uh, if you want to go to uh, Clarence uh, Larkin's uh, or Dispensational Truths, you know. you'll see these charts. Now, this is going to be a little different from what his, and I've researched a lot on this stuff, and this is what most uh, Bible scholars come up with, so I'm not feeding you anything that's new. This is kind of old. There was a creative age, the original earth, and then it went into a chaotic state. If you read verse 2, it says, And the earth was without form and void. God never creates anything without perfection. He doesn't create things in chaos. When Satan was created, he was created perfect. When Adam was created, he was created perfect until a test comes, and that's when you either pass the test or you don't, and there's only one that's passed the test. And then you have the creative week, which is what we're, uh, we're, we're looking at in Genesis chapter 1 from 2 all the way down to 31. And then you have Eden, the age of conscience, and the Andalusian age, the age before the flood. And then you have the flood, and then the present age, the age of law. That's when Moses was given the law. And then we have Christ's atonement, and the church age. And then we have the great tribulation, and the kingdom age, which is king of heaven. And then we go to the white throne judgment. And that's when we go, after that, we go into the perfect age. That's when all sin and everything's wiped out. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. God is going to cause the earth to be destroyed by fire the next time. Two times with water, and the next time will be by uh, fire. Well, how did all this happen? You'll find this in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13. It says, Thou hast been in the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the burial, the onyx. All these coverings were on, on Satan. He was created perfect. It says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the mountain of God, and the house walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. When the iniquity was found in him, he had corrupted one-third of the angels, the sons of God, and when they were cast out, they were cast out into this abyss. The bottom, Peter says it's like this. It's the, water, the, the earth was in the water and out of the water. It was like a uh, floating around in this water. It was in chaos. It was in turmoil. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? There's three <laughs> phases to, to Satan's fall. First, he rebelled on the original earth, and God cast him out along with the earth and one-third of the angels. Then it says here, how art thou cut down to the ground? If you know anything about Revelations, Revelations chapter, uh, I believe it's uh, 12, or he's cast down to the ground. And he causes havoc, and that's where the great tribulation is going on. And then thou didst weaken the nations. That's the return from the from the from hell during the after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. He'll be turned loose on this earth once again to deceive the nations. And then we go into the white throne judgment. Isaiah chapter fourteen verse thirteen says, "For thou hast said in thine heart, I will send." To heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit 
upon the mount of the congregation in the size of the north. Satan wanted to be where God was. Satan has never seen God, but he wanted to be like God. And this is a this deep, and, and the reason they came up with a with a uh, triangle or pyramid type shape. It has four sides and has a four-sided bottom. And this is where, when you look up into space, what you're looking at is the darkness is the deep that's around this area right here. Uh, when they set the Hubble telescope up, they said, you know, they, they mapped the whole cosmos, all 48 constellations, which make up trillions and trillions of stars. And they came up with a map. And this map has all the constellations in it. And this, this constellation is right in the middle here. And they said, beyond that, and this is what they said when they first came up with the Hubble telescope, they said, we see that there's water up there. Imagine that. Well, that's what the Bible says. Imagine this. There is a grid, interlocking grid, up there. And it looks like it's holding back the water. Now, I read those articles. I seen the pictures. And you can't find them anywhere now. So I can't prove it. But there was, there was, I, I got a real good memory about stuff. And I'm telling you, I looked everywhere for that, and I can't find it. If you've got a copy of it, I'd like to have a copy of it. But anyway, this is what it looks like. That's what God says it looks like. Go to uh, second, or the second verse of Genesis chapter 2. It says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now nobody knows how long the earth was like that in the water bobbing up and down. Nobody knows that. But he says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. This was the deep. It was dark. No light. But wherever Jesus Christ goes, there's light. When he came to this earth, he was the light of the world. <laughs> and God called the light day and the darkness night. And the evening and the morning was the first day. Now look what he says here. And he said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and we're not even talking about the earth, we're talking about space. You know, the laws of physics says you have to have space, and then you, you can have matter. But you can't have matter without space. Does that make sense to you? We're all taking up space in here. But if, we're, if we had no space, there would be none of us. So God had to create a void, a bubble, so to speak, in the middle of this deep. And that's where he put the earth. And that's where he left this void here, and then he put it, put the earth in the empty, empty space. That's what God says. This is what the Bible says. It says, and, and, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it be divided Divide the waters from the waters. And you know what? I was, I was doing a lot of research this week. And just type in bubbles in outer space. You'll see a lot of that. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. So you got up here and down here and a little bit on the sides. But this is where Satan dwells. This is where Job says Satan dwells. And we'll be looking at that here in a second. And 
Isaiah chapter 41, it says, in verse 25, it says, I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come from the sides of rising of the sun, shall he call upon my name, and he shall come upon the princes, and upon the walk, uh, mort as upon mortar, and the potter, the tread of clay. There's only one. Satan wants to be that one, but he's not the one. It's only the Lord Jesus Christ, and nobody else. In Genesis chapter 2, we just covered that, or Gen Genesis chapter uh, 1, verse 2, all the way to 6. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18, it says, May be uh, able to comprehend with all the saints the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. If you take a compass and you have that magnetic needle on it and you set that thing down, it will always point north. Now, true north is 32 degrees up. That's where true north is. That's where God dwells. That's what the Bible says. He says he dwells on the sides of the north. Now, if you look at that north, it'll be more like this right here. This is, this is where God dwells on, the, on top of this. He has doors. And he talks about the windows. And that's what NASA said. It's, it's, got, it's like an interlocking grid with windows. When they found that, you know, whenever NASA proves something was right with the Word of God, they quickly get rid of it. And NASA, and this isn't proving the Word of God. The Word of God is proving that NASA was right then, but they're not right now. Because they don't believe in God, they don't, they don't want God, they, they want to serve some alien, I guess. In Job chapter 26, verse 7, it says, He stretches out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. And this is the empty place, and the earth is hung on nothing. Everything comes out of the north when it comes to God. And Satan wants to dwell where God dwells. That's his main goal. He ain't got a chance in hell of getting there. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, he says, And after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. There's a door in heaven. You're going to go through that door one day. There's windows in heaven. Genesis chapter 8, verse 2 says, The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped. When the flood was going taking place, God had to stop, shut the windows in heaven. And you say, well, I don't believe that. Then you got problems with the Bible. Right, right. Now creationists say, well, the fountains of the deep are in the earth, and they broke open and spewed all this water out, and they covered the mountains by 15 cubits over the, the highest mountains in the world. Where's the water at now? Where'd it go? You can't get that much water in the atmosphere. But what, what does God have to say about it? That's what we're going to look at. But anyway, the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 9 says, and this is a very curious passage. It says, My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the window, showing himself through the lattice. What is a grid? It's lattice. He's looking through the lattice. He's looking through this grid, and he's peeking at his bride, and he's waiting to come back. He wants his bride, and he's just waiting for the right time. When you look at other things in the Bible, you, some, of the, some of the things that you, you learn in the Bible, and you, you try to put them all together, 
I came to Matthew chapter 27, verse 31, or 35. He says, They crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And you think, well, what's that to do with the great deep? It's got, it's got a lot to do with the great deep. This thing right here is boundaries. This great deep right here represents something. When I was up, when I was up, looking at this, I, I looked at uh, a garment that got Christ wore. And this garment was different from a lot of stuff, but you see it all the time. I mean, you see it, but you don't know what you're looking at a lot of times. But the garment was like this. It was a square, of course this ain't square, but it, right in the middle of it had a circle and you put it over your head. That's why when you walked around, they had this uh, cloth over the top of their, their arms. It was shaped like, it, it draped over them like a pyramid. <laughs> and they took it off of them and they sold it. I mean, this is my thought on this. The robe that was removed from the Lord before His crucifixion is a type of what will happen to the cosmos after the thousand year reign of Christ. The fabric of time and space will be done away with along with the deep. In addition, they that have rejected God's plan of redemption will stand naked before Him at the great white throne judgment. There will be no sea of glass. <clears throat> All this is going to be done away with. This all disappears after the uh, millennial reign of Jesus Christ, after the white throne judgment. All of this is gone. It's burned up in a fervent heat. And they stand on nothing at the white throne judgment. And every knee will bow. I don't know how they're going to do it. They're going to, they're going to bow. And they're going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What God has done, God planned all this before, the, before time even began. He had all this mapped out. And what we're seeing today is the end of part of that. We're almost at the end. In Matthew chapter, or Hebrews chapter 1 verse 10, it says something very odd here. It says, and thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands, and they shall perish, but thou remainest. They all shall wax old as doth a cloth, and as a vesture shall thou fold them up and shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. This is going to, this is all going to disappear. Where Satan dwells, that is all going to disappear. <coughs> this is what the Bible describes as the flood. Isaiah chapter 27 verse 1 says this describes what's in the deep and why it's so worrisome. Why do you think you have to be escorted to heaven? You've got to go through the deep to get up here to that sea of glass. You can't go up there without being escorted. We're going to get to that. It's pretty wild. And the day of the Lord 
with his sword, a great sword, a great strong sword, shall punish Lothiathan, the piercing serpent, even the Lothiathan, the crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. That's the deep. Job talks about in Job 41.1. He says that he makes the, the, the deep boil like a pot of oil, hot oil, or he makes it horror. He's mad. He wants, he wants to defeat God. He can't. He doesn't even know who God is. Like most of us, we have no idea who God is. We know the Lord Jesus Christ, but we don't know what. One day we'll be introduced to Him. I can't wait for that. But right now we don't know. In Exodus chapter 13, or 14, Moses takes the children of Israel across the Red Sea. <clears throat> they have to escort, Moses has to escort the children of Israel across. He's a type of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, it says, Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, that means examples for us, and they are written for our emanation upon whom this ends of the world are come. That's us. The end of the world is about ready to come. And just like Moses escorted the children of Israel across the Red Sea, and Red Sea got its name not by accident, they just went through the uh, 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 slaying of the lamb, and now they're going to go across the Red Sea. They have to be escorted. Why? Because the Pharaoh and his armies are pursuing them. They want to kill them. And they're not going to let them get through that easy. But God. Moses protected the children of Israel. That was God's man. Example, just like Jesus Christ escorted them through. In Revelation chapter 4, we got another. The Bible says, and the doors were open. That door in heaven was open, and something comes down. The Lord Jesus Christ descends in a cloud, and we're caught up together with him in that cloud. And the reason I drew all these things, I'm, I know it looks silly, but <coughs> Moses has more than a call from dry land to the promised land. When we are here, God's going to call us up. We're going to meet him in a cloud. Why does he have to meet us in a cloud? Because he has to escort us up. Because of this. And this is going to try to keep us from going up. But we are escorted by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we have no problem. Amen. Just like Moses crossing the Red Sea, no problem. We're going to be escorted up into heaven. And then we're going to be on a sea of glass. Now, when we're looking through this sea of glass, and it's just like a mirror. You look on one side of the mirror, it's black. You can't see nothing. But you look on the other side, you see your reflection. One day, you're going, to, you're going to be called up to the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to be on that sea of glass. And you're going to look down at that sea of glass and you're going to go, Wow! Look at me! I look like Jesus! Because we're conformed to His image. We're going to be uh, uh, types of Christ. We're not going to be Christ. We're going, to do, we're going to do His work. I can't wait to see that body. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12 says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. Wow. I'm going to know everything. 
Yeah, people thinks I'm a know-it-all anyway, but I will be a know-it-all. <coughs> you got to love the Word of God. I think I missed a page, but anyway, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the flood for just a second. And uh, that's what I get from <coughs> Going on script. Or have something gone on Here it is. Here it go. In Genesis chapter 7, 11, it says, In the 600th year of Noah, of course, 600 year of, uh, of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day, were all the fountains of the great deep, if you read Job, the great deep is that body of water that's beyond our, our constellations and all that, broke up, broken up, and the windows of heaven were open, and the water came pouring out. And you say, well, what happened to that water? When Genesis chapter 8, 2 says, In the fountains of the deep, and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. The flood took approximately 407 days, if you want to add them all up. That's not a whole lot of time for that much water to disappear. So what happened to it? Chapter 8, verse 13. And it came to pass in the 600th in the first year, in the first month of the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. They were gone. God dried them up and took them away. Put them back up in the deep. Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the earth ground was dry. And the second month, in the seventh and 20th day of the month was the earth dried. God took the water away. Job says that the, this great deep is frozen. And that's why we have the sea of glass up here on top, where God dwells. When you get to uh, looking at this stuff, and I always wondered about why we had to be escorted up and the midterm rapture where Moses and Elijah are taken up. Jesus Christ just calls them up, doesn't come down, escorts them out. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. It says, I heard a great voice from heaven. Come up, that uh, now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which causes them before our God, or accuses them before our God day and night. And I heard a voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of our Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him with the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of the testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. What happens mid mid midway through the tribulation? Satan and his angels are cast down to earth. The people of the earth need escorting. Not the saints, because when they go up, they're, they're going to go up un, un, uh, no one's going to bother. There's no one there. 
is in it's all <coughs> when I found out I went wow <laughs> Bible's great Revelation chapter 15 verse 2 it says I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over the image and over its mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having hearts of God when all this stuff is going on, you know, in the book, in Matthew chapter 24, it says, as in the days of Noah. And then it says, as in the days of Lot. The days of Noah, Noah got aboard the ark. He was there seven days, safe and secure. And then the rain started. And the, the, the judgment of the world lifted the ark up and carried them safely above all the turmoil. And then when it was finished, the ark came back down to earth, and they got out safe and secure. No life was lost aboard the ark. He preached for 120 years without one convert. There's a lot of preachers out there right now that have been preaching for a long time, and not one convert. The world is ripe for judgment. They're selling, they're, they're wanting to sell men makeup now. And you say, oh man, they go wear makeup. Years ago when I was a kid, you know, if a, a boy would come around with an earring in, he was a sissy. And then all of a sudden you've seen all these boys come around with earrings. My boy came home with a fake earring one time. <laughs> he, just, he was just going to test me. But anyway, I, this is what we have today. They're feminizing the men, and they said that the, this, the, these, these companies say, we can do it. We can make men wear makeup. Not this man. <laughs> I'm so tired of this world. And that's just the least of our problems make up. we got a lot more problems than that. It's horrible what's going on in this world. But anyway, God says that one day all this is going to be wiped away. Or this is all going to be gone. And God's, when God recreates the heavens and the earth, is heaven singular and earth again. Just like Matthew chapter or Genesis chapter 1 1. But that's not going to be here. Because God says that His kingdom is going to go forever. It's going to be ever expanding. Boom, 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 boom. It'll keep on going. There's no limitations. What a world we got ahead of us. Do you know it? Do you know him? Do you know that you're saved without a shadow of a doubt? If you do not know that, I would get on my knees and cry out to God. I was talking to a, a brother that visited from New York last night, and he gave us his testimony. And he said, I thought I was saved. I was a good man. I said, I was thinking to myself, I was raised in a family. We didn't do nothing wrong. Because Dad had a belt. A hundred miles long. He could reach you anywhere. And he wasn't afraid to use it. I think he enjoyed it. And when I grew up, I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I didn't do all those things that most people do. And then I got into the world. I even started, I started a couple church, or started a church down Pensacola, or not Pensacola, but Destin. And I got into the world and got away from church, and God showed me who I was. He showed me what I was, just like He showed this brother back here. And when He got, when when the Holy Spirit got finished with me, I was running. I ran to the altar. 
I wanted to get saved right now. I did not want to go to hell. I was riding a motorcycle, and I wasn't that good of a motorcycle rider, so I was really worried. I thought, God's going to kill me today. But do you know him? That's the question. Search your hearts. Make sure. Because it's so, so important. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire with the where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever. You know, the most, the, the oddest thing that you're going to find in hell is you. You don't have to go there. You don't, it wasn't made for you to go there. It was made for this. It wasn't made for you. There's no comparison in hell when you send a little human being down to hell with this and that in it. You'll be tormented like you won't believe. Sometimes just go online and type in some of these people that have died on an operating table and been dead for a few minutes and read what they what they say. It will scare you to death. You don't want to be there because it wasn't made for you. God prepared a way for you to escape all that. You know, here lately, the pastor's been elaborating on it a lot about salvation. You know, the worst thing I can think of is our church family. One person going to hell for my church family. I love this church family. I think the world, I pray for everybody in this church. We'll name all people left and right going through this church every night. Praying that God will heal you, that God will embolden you, God will encourage you, God will do things that will help you to serve Him. I pray for these preacher boys. You know, the, the greatest honor in the world is to become a preacher boy. That's a high calling. And the, the most preachers will ask themselves, why did God God call me? And I'll tell you why. And the reverend said the same thing one time. He said, no one else will go. If you're willing, God will use you. In Revelation chapter 21, 1 it says, And I will, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. The deep is gone. I can't wait. And I want to see everyone here. Let's pray. Our dear and Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this message, Lord. I pray that it helps someone. I pray that it encourages someone. And I pray, Lord, that it will give them a deeper meaning to your word and show you how big our God is. The Bible says that he's a terrible majesty. One day we're going to have to stand before you, Lord, and give an account. Lord, help us not to be ashamed. Lord, help us to be watching when you come. If nothing else, give us a, give us a crown for watching for your return. Help us to be witnesses. Help us to be testimonies. And Lord, I pray that you'll help the preacher as he preaches today. I pray that you'll give him strength and Give him power on high. And I pray for that soul that's going to be in here tonight or on the internet that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that today will be their day of salvation. For asking in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.